All right. Hey, how's it, everybody? It is 5 p.m. West Coast time, 3 p.m. Hawaii time, 8 p.m. on that East Coast, and 7 p.m. for our Central Time people. So good to see we've got some folks here coming in on this lovely Sunday afternoon. Not sure what it's like over in your neck of the woods, folks, but goodness gracious, if you're in the Pacific Northwest and you're inside watching this stream, oh my, I am impressed with your <clears throat> with your capability to stay inside. Because I'll tell you what, it is a beautiful day out, not even barely 80 degrees, maybe like 77, perfect August afternoon. Uh, so for those of you who have had a great weekend, I'm glad you're ta choosing to wind things down with Chatter with Statter and the Statterbox crew. I am Mad Statter. Let's get this party started. Okay, excellent. It looks like we've got Gina in the house talking about how wonderful it is to have Lono music in the background. It looks like, though, I don't have Lono music in the background, but now I might. So hopefully that background music just popped into your ears. And um, all right, we've got Rick here saying that we've got the 720p broadcast with the gear. What that means for folks who are new around here, if Twitch is being twitchy, grab that gear, <clears throat> lower your uh, input speed, your resolution, make the number lower, and it just might help. So. I'm not going to tell you how, I'm not going to tell you why, I'm just going to tell you that oftentimes works. And it looks like we got Kenny from the Cove, and let's see here, Darlene's in the house as well, streaming up. Gina, yeah, Rick, Darlene, Kenny, all right, the usual suspects are here today. Um, let's see here, um, Gina, I don't, <clears throat> Gina, here, hi, I'm Matt Statter. And I'm really technologically stupid when it comes to things and stuff. And stream elements, honestly, I haven't set it up to do much of anything. Um, Shock, who's not here at the moment that I know of, is the one who is, has set everything up. And you're totally right. I don't have the weather bots. Um, I have no doubt in my mind that setting up the weather bots are like a two second thing. But for some reason, stream elements really intimidates me and so um <clears throat> i'll get shock on that shall we we do need to get that weather that weather bot in in sync because everybody i will tell you this everybody is different but everybody has weather everybody has weather so it's something everybody can enjoy all right looks like e-music is sliding in Puzzy cat coming in fantastic andre here as well all righty happy sunday to everyone Oh, e-music. Okay, so I was just bragging about, you know, the 75, 77 degree perfect weather here. E-music has 65 degrees. Now, I'm sure for lots and lots of folks, 65 degrees in August, that's the worst news ever. Mm -mm. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's the best news ever. So, um, you know, I never thought that I would be thinking that Wisconsin sounds like a place for me to be, but um, maybe. 71, Gina, beautiful. See, I am all about the Midland weather. If I was Mother Nature and I had a magic wand to make, um, well, at least my living space the way I wanted, the weather would always be between 57 or 75. And so far, it sounds like we've got several folks who are right in that jam. Excelente. So, um, <clears throat> so I want to thank, though, um, everyone who hung out uh, yesterday uh, for Statterbox at the Cinema. We got, we had a little bit of a, I don't really know what we're watching. We ended up watching Goonies. And Kenny, I'm so glad that you guys are, uh, that you're here because, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure I've already asked you this. I'm pretty sure I already know this, but were, were you the one who lent who lent us Goonies? And at this point gave us Goonies because it was about, oh, a year ago that you probably sent this to me. And as you can see, I haven't sent it back. But 
um, Kenny, this did used to belong to you, right? Or am I making that up? Um, so please tell me because it has been haunting my mind. And oh, Pacola T, hey, all right. Pacola T is here and she is 86 and muggy. Or not she, but you know, the thing. Uh, the weather and 86 and muggy, that's no bueno. That's no bueno. I, I, I feel for you, hon. I hope that you've got um, a big old air conditioner or a big old fan at your face. And um, Kenny from the Cove, it wasn't you? Shoot, did I end up, I wonder, did I buy it? Okay, well then I guess I won't worry about getting it back to you since you weren't the one who lent it to me. All right then, so, hmm. Live and learn. Okay, good to know. And let's see here. <laughs> um, and by the way, 91 after 70 or after 7 p.m. in the evening. Kenny, oh Kenny, please tell me you have an AC. Please tell me you at least have one tiny little window AC unit for one room in your house to not be hell. <clears throat> yeah, there, I said it. I said the H word. Oh my, oh my. And hey, Shock is in the house. Fantastic. So, I don't know, um, Shock, if you were here earlier when I was dropping your name as my um, as my personal tech guru, but uh, it seems as though I should get on the ball, which means I should ask you, um, <laughs> do you think we could install some weather bots on the stream elements one day? And by we, um, I guess I actually mean you, because I still don't know how to do those things yet. So there you go. Um, yeah, weather bots one day, and um, <clears throat> no no hurries or worries, of course. But um, yeah, and yes, I do mean you. I do mean you, Shock. You are my guru, my tech guru. And um, oh, Kenny, good. You're at your sister's house. Quite cool at your sister's house. Good, good, good. That makes me very, very happy to hear. Um, so okay, now Pacola T. I believe it was you. I am good at making stuff up though. So, um, uh, let's see here. Um, wait, Andre says you heard that in Death Valley, they're gonna turn off the electricity for eight hours. Everybody gonna have to leave and go to air conditioning. Well, you mean go to another place with air conditioning? Cause I can only assume that the electricity in Death Valley is mostly used for air conditioning, right? Right? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so. Um, but back to back to what I was about to say. Hey, shock, uh, not shock. Um, Cola T. I think it was you who um, who mentioned the other day, maybe last Wednesday, that um, perhaps we should talk about salmon. And so, you guys today are going to be learning more about Pacific Coast salmon than you probably ever thought you would ever learn in your life. In fact, as I was prepping for this little um, this little show, uh, I was learning some things about salmon, even though I've lived here for uh, 40 some odd years, I was learning about salmon, things about salmon that I didn't even know. So um, so we will be heading into that Salmon Talk, Salmon Talk Sunday in a little bit. But first off, <clears throat> I have to acknowledge what Rick is saying. So <clears throat> now that it's Sunday night, the sky is clearing up from two days of rain and clouds. Yeah, AKA the weekend. I think Rick, some weather scientifical mathematical person did a study once um, and they actually did verify why it seemed like it always rained on the weekends and then cleared up again for um, you know the week. And apparently it is a legitimate weather phenomena. Uh, and it has to do with the pollution caused by cars commuting, I guess. And so, um, I mean, it's way more complicated than what I just said. But ultimately, one of the factors was, yeah, people going to work during the week is what makes it rainy on Saturday and Sunday. So it's like, well, that's just can't win for losing. Yeah, there you go. And um, oh my goodness! All right, so it looks like it looks like we've got some ice cream sundays going on today, and I didn't mean that the way it came out. So it is an ice cream sundae kind of day. And um, and Rick, okay, so you you know what I'm talking about? Science said it always rains on the weekend because of air pollution. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so see, sometimes I don't make stuff up. Other times, other times maybe I do on accident, not on purpose. It seems true when I said it. So, um, 
<laughs> Fuzzy cat, you call it ice cream o'clock? Lovely. Okay, so you guys are making me wonder um, what kind of ice cream, right? Like, is it chocolate? Is it pralines and cream? Is it Rocky Road? Is it is it Blackberry Ripple? I don't really know if they make a Blackberry Ripple, but I'd like it if they did. And um, Andre, you're going to go get an It's, an It's, It's. There you go. And for those who don't know what an It's, It's is, it's a... I love the English language. Uh, it's a uh, oatmeal cookies as the as a, it's an oatmeal cookie sandwich that's chocolate that's covered in chocolate. I mean, there's other flavors and stuff too, but that's the basic idea of what it is. Um, and they're good. They sell them in Hawaii, but they started in the Bay Area. And um, so yeah, uh, Kenny gnarliest stones stones gnarliest storms you've had you've ever um, endured have always been on the weekend. Yeah, and you know that's too bad because it's like. Dude, boss, I can't leave the house. You know, it's tornado time. I'm not supposed to be driving. Like, why couldn't a storm like that happen on Monday so you don't have to go into work? But no, you're already not going to go to work, so you have to stay home because of this gnarly storm. And, um, oh, my goodness, so peanut butter seems to be the theme of the day. So, Andre, do they have a peanut butter it's it? Because it sounds like you're going to need to get the peanut butter flavor because Darlene just had chocolate peanut butter swirl. Yum. Probably one of my top five faves and then of course Kenny from the Cove had to chime in with half a pint of peanut butter cup ice cream okay okay and chocolate and coffee with Hershey syrup says Puzzy Cat uh, also delicious also delicious you know as a kid I hated coffee whereas my sister she actually she was drinking black coffee since she was like four um, black coffee and tonic Seriously, my sister had such a sophisticated palate when she was four. She was drinking black coffee, um, white wine, and tonic water. Those were some of her three favorite things to drink. Now, when I say white wine, wait, what? How old was she again? No, she was way too young to be drinking white wine. Do not get me wrong. But my mom had wine in a box, right? Now, my mom had the boxed wine in the fridge on the highest, highest shelf. My sister couldn't reach it. That's true, she couldn't reach it. Unless she pulled a chair to the fridge, so I don't know what my mom was thinking. I can't tell you how many times I caught my sister. Chair up to the fridge, fridge door open. She's standing on the chair with her little fluorescent pink cup, filling it up with the wine, drinking the wine, filling it up, drinking it. It was just, um, yeah, she was a big white wine fan when she was a child. And uh, black coffee, white wine, and tonic water. I swear she was, like, obviously reborn from some, you know, 35-year-old city food snob or something. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. there you have it. So, um, oh, shock. Okay, well, all right. Okay, shock wins it. Shock won. She won. She won the world. She won the Internet. Her husband made... Lilikoi ice cream today. For those of you who aren't familiar, Lilikoi is also known as passion fruit, and passion fruit ice cream sounds like the best thing in the world, so I guess you won the internet today, Shock. No two ways about that. You did. You did. And Kenny from the Cove, you're addicted to anything coffee flavored, especially ice cream. Yeah, I didn't like coffee. So what started that little tangent about my sister? I didn't like coffee, unlike her as a kid, but coffee ice cream, dude, oh, so tasty. Definitely uh, one of my favorite ice creams, even as a child. So, um, so uh, yeah, exactly, Darlene. Everyone be everyone be a little bit jealous of shock. <laughs> <clears throat> Andre, you like the Lily Koi, especially the fresh juice. I don't know if I've ever had the fresh juice. I can say though, at Zippy's they have the Lily Koi drink. Now, I'm not saying that that's fresh at all. In fact, I'm guessing it's not. Um, but, oh, I love the Lilico drink at, um, at Zippy. So tasty. Um, and uh, let's see here. Your great grandma loved coffee ice cream. Yeah, yeah, that, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's such a great flavor. I can only assume, you know, that there are some ice cream flavors that, like, came before, you know, and I would, you know, van obviously vanilla, obviously chocolate. And then obviously strawberry, 
Um, but I'm gonna have to say, I'm gonna have to guess that coffee was probably one of those original base flavors, you know? Um, and then I'm gonna guess mint as well, because all of those things are pretty easy and, and common flavor, um, easy to add flavorings to. Uh, not easy to add flavorings to, what am I trying to say? Mint, very commonly used to extract the flavor to flavor other stuff, what I'm trying to say here. So, um, so I, I do, obviously I don't, I don't know the history of the flavor build and exploration of the early ice cream days, but I'm gonna guess that coffee was probably one of the earlier ice cream flavors. And um, uh, Andre, I love even the fake little quote. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't really care if it's real or if it's fake or if it's preserved or it's frozen or if it's fresh or it's whatever. I mean, it's delicious. So let me drink, let me drink it or eat it or whatever. <laughs> Kenny. Huh. Kenny's wondering how a coffee float with vanilla ice cream would taste. Now, I'm going to... Okay. Oh, huh. Okay. Wow. Um, so, Pacola Tea, they have... Oh, you know, I think K-Man has shown a video about the coffee jello. And I kind of freaked out about coffee jello, and I don't think I would like it, but I totally would try it. And, which is the reason why I'm saying that now is because, Kenny, I think that an ice cream, a coffee, blah, 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 okay. You couldn't do it with hot coffee, right? Because it wouldn't stay afloat. The ice cream would melt immediately. So you'd probably want to do it with cold coffee, right? And I don't know how, I mean, I think that might be good, but my biggest concern is, why don't we already see this? Which makes me think, well, did somebody already do this and it was not good at all? Or are we discovering something and thinking of a new thing that needs to be done? Because seriously, dude, I mean, actually to tell you the truth, you know, you said a vanilla, vanilla, you know, vanilla, obviously. Well, yeah, that's sort of obvious, but why not chocolate? Two, either instead or um you know because chocolate and coffee is a very common uh flavor combo and so a coffee float with ice cream has anybody ever seen or heard of something like that um and then um <clears throat> shock i've heard of guinness ice cream and um and let's see here um uh in Italy, they have something called granita. The traditional flavors are lemon and coffee, and those things are old. Yeah, but granita isn't ice cream. Granita is just a frozen slush. Or, okay, it's not a frozen slush. It's actually way more complicated to make than that. But it doesn't have cream in it, is what I'm saying. So that's a different thing. And um, and yeah, and so Kenny from the Cove, you're picturing cold black coffee poured over keto, keto vanilla ice cream for you. Fine, fine. But regardless of the ice cream, I think that the, um, yeah, I think, okay, so you agree, cold, cold coffee. I don't know, dude. I feel like, um, that is a really good idea and I don't know why. Okay, so, sh okay, so, all right, Kenny, we're not going to be, Kenny, we're not going to be the billionaires that we thought we were going to be. Because Shock's just like, I just found dozens of recipes on the interwebs. So fine, all right, we're not going to be the, the quadrillionaires. Still, though, um... And um, <clears throat> and Rick, uh, it looks like, so Rick, from what the video was that K-Man showed with the coffee jello, it if you stir it up enough, it like breaks down so you can drink it with a, it looks like you get the big like boba straws when they serve it, at least where he got it. So I think you're supposed to drink it. But like if you stir it, the chunks, cause it's just, it's like little cubes that they put it. This is the only version of coffee jello I've ever seen. The one time that Camuela Man showed a picture, a video, I don't remember, but it looked like the coffee cubes. They were little coffee cubes. And if you stirred it, they kind of broke up. So you definitely are supposed to drink it um, from what his says, but then Piccola T's like, oh no, you eat it with a spoon, like jello. So that's not what I saw K-Man, because K-Man had it in a cup and, you know, with like milk and ice and stuff. Um, 
So now I'm very confused. And a pussy cat, you a pussy cat, you hear that ice cream is gonna be hard to get, like toilet paper. Oh no, that's not good. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah. Oh, okay, Andre. Yeah. Okay, so the greeny, the flavors are just yeah. The flavors are really old. Was the main point to that? Okay, gotcha. Missed your point entirely. Sorry about that. But yeah, coffee. Exactly. That's what I mean. Coffee is such an old flavor. Um, I would like to think that um, that it would be one of the earlier ice cream flavors. Um, but you know, um, I don't know. And, uh, let's see here. Um, <clears throat> and, um, all right. So yeah, you know, oh God, you know, Kenny. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ooh, you know, Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. So you're talking about, um, uh, coffee shaved ice. So that might be really tasty, especially it's, it's creating like a um with the little snow cap of the condensed milk like the vietnamese coffees you know how they've got their vietnamese iced coffee is coffee with the condensed milk so you could totally get a little snow cap of your uh shave ice coffee and um oh that would be good that would be good um rick chunky coffee no thanks you like to drink your coffee the old way yeah that was kind of my impression when i saw the um the drink it very much reminded me of the whole boba tea experience, which for me is just like gross. I don't understand the fascination with boba, boba in your drink, with like the mochi in your drink, the all that. Mm, I just mm -mm. so yeah, the um, the coffee jello did seem a little bit along that thing, and I would yeah, it's a texture thing, man. I don't know if I'd like that. Um, let's see here. Um, oh, shock, are you checking out your thing? If you did your thing? I don't think you, um, spelt weather right, though, so I don't think it'll work. No, you spelt weather wrong, dude. You accidentally had an F at the end of your weather, so I don't think it's gonna work when you did it, when you tried it that way. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Andre is saying 1869 is the first mention of coffee ice cream in the USA. Um, uh, <laughs> Pagola tea, you're sorry you like mochi, but boba makes you think of tadpoles. That's hysterical. And um, uh, oh, did you? Oh, so did you really name it? <laughs> did you really name it Weather F, or are you just making fun? Uh, Pagola tea, though. Okay, so you like mochi, but do you like mochi in your drink? Cause like I've seen on Amanda and F and Felix Eats, they're a YouTube, they're bleh, they're creators on YouTube that go around Oahu eating um uh eating um well local food, duh, and uh and they usually get like dessert drinks and they really like their boba tea, and in some of the places they offer mochi. Now I don't know what they mean by that, but it's in the drink. And it okay, all right. So Pocola tea, nope, no mochi balls, tadpoles in your drink. Okay, so you know, so it is tiny little mochi balls. It, mm -mm, I just don't like it. Mm -mm. <laughs> but you know what? No problem, because if you do like it, I'm not making fun of you. All that means is I am never ever going to be in competition for the last boba in the shop. You can have it all, my friend. You can have all of that stuff. I will never be in competition, ever, for the very last. If it's the last one, it's all yours. I will happily step away. And um, let's see here. Um, Darlene, yes, the creamy toppy on top of the coffee shaved ice, like mocha or other even coffee flavors could be used too. Yes, yes. Um, and so, Pocola tea, I think they call it tapioca, but the same texture as mochi. I thought that that's what the boba balls were. I thought that the boba balls were tapioca balls. And then I thought the mochi balls were mochi balls. But I can tell you right now, I don't know what I'm talking about because I don't really want to eat it or drink it or whatever you're supposed to do with it once it's in your drink. I don't really want to do it. So, there. Um, oh my goodness, so it really is weather. <laughs> oh, I love it. It's weather. Yay! 
Oh, okay, Pacola T. I wasn't, I was, okay, I was misunderstanding what you're saying. Bubble balls are top heel cut. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I am not um, being, hey, Anne, good to see you. We are right now talking about whether or not, we're talking about, we're dreaming of coffee and the different forms coffee can take. There's coffee jello, um, and then there's coffee shave ice. Coffee shave ice isn't necessarily something that exists necessarily, but we think it should, and we're coming up with recipes for it. But we also all sort of seem to agree that um, we don't want boba or mochi in the coffee shaved ice. That just would be wrong. So now you're kind of um, caught up. Oh, and we've got the weather robot now, too, thanks to Shock. Only it's called Weatherf, which is the best. Weatherf. Exclamation point Weatherf. It ends with an F. I love it. And um, so there we go. Kenny from the Cove. Balls and drinks. If they aren't ice balls, I will pass. Precisely. That is pretty much how I feel about that. And, and we're... Okay, so coffee anything would be yummy. On a, As a general rule... I would um, agree with you, but we're discussing the concept of coffee jello and whether or not you eat it with a spoon or whether or not you d put it in drinks and drink it with a drink, drink it with a straw, drink it, drink it. Um, so I guess my question for you is, what's your thought on the whole coffee jello thing? And Poppy Sheeny, good to see you. Glad you're here joining us on this warm, sunny Sunday evening in August when you could be choosing to be elsewhere. Very happy you're hanging out with the Statterbox crew. Talking about ice creams and stuff right now. Um, and we're talking about coffee, coffee ice cream, coffee jello. And, um, <laughs> and okay, and you come to your senses. No, no coffee jello though. Coffee's good, but no coffee jello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so funny. Um, and then let's see here. We've got a lot going on, and I think I missed something important about. We do have. Okay, so Andre's coming in. Coffee shave ice does exist. And it does come with mochi cube on top. <laughs> no. No. So, no. No. No, now coffee shave ice, I will say, coffee shave ice with the snow cap of the condensed milk, a la Vietnamese iced coffee, I will, I will stay, I will, I will argue in favor of this, but no, no mochi on top, no, no need for da mochi, no need for da mochi, no, and, um, <laughs> coffee, <laughs> Kenny from the Cove Coffee Jello. Why not just peel the lid off and snork it down like a Jello shot? Honestly, I would rather do Coffee Jello like that than uh, than in the drink the way I saw Kamawaga Man have it. Um, it would just be easier. And snork it down is funny, Anne. But honestly, isn't that the best description of what you do with those little? jello shots you know i mean it's not like you eat them daintily right and you don't snort them but you might as well <laughs> snork them <laughs> um um oh yeah i know that people can have the mochi if chosen i just say no no <laughs> no <laughs> Um, it's not that I don't like mochi. I just don't like it on shave ice. It just, it isn't, it doesn't, the textures don't work for me. Mm -mm. Um, but hey, you know, like I said, we're not going to argue over the last mochi, mochi in the shop. And, um, and let's see here. Okay, so Shock is saying that coffee jelly is um, a Japanese thing. Okay. Um, uh, but... It, I ha I'm going to have to ignore that because Anne just said that you've never had an alcoholic jello shot, though. Okay, well, then you might not be able to appreciate the snork quite in the same way, but you've seen people doing jello shots, right? I think you can get an appreciation for the snork factor. <laughs> and Poppy, Poppy Shaney, can, can we go? Can you? All right, here, Poppy Shaney. Here's what we're going to do. 
He's going to hop in his plane and he's going to come pick me up in Seattle. Then we're going to go to Minnesota. We're going to make a bunch of jello shots and we're going to do a bunch of jello shots with Ann Ware. Then we're going to hang out for a while because then Poppy's going to have to wait like, what, 24 hours before he can fly again? And then we'll fly back. But clearly, Poppy Shaney and I need to take care of the situation. And Shock has no. Poppy Shaney, we've got we've got our work cut out for us. We've got our work cut out for us. Cause I know, Poppy, you've done a jello shot. I mean, I know. Are you telling me, Fuzzy Cat, that you've never had a jello shot either? Oh my. Oh my. All right. All right, then. Obviously, we know what... <clears throat> Obviously, we know the first... If we're going to have some kind of situation and a party, obviously, the first course of the introductory introductories is going to be jello shots for everyone. My goodness. Um, all right, then. That is hysterical. Yeah, we'll all meet in Minnesota. Minnesota. Minnesota is where we'll all meet. And there will be jello shots to be had for everyone. And Andre, you can, if you, if, okay, well, you better make a whole lot, Andre, because if you're going to make Jalilicoy jello shots, I'm going to eat them all. And then I'll probably have, like, alcohol poisoning, but it'll be worth every minute of it, because it's Jalilicoy. And, um, <laughs> Bobby Shaney, thank you so much for gifting that sub to Mariana and for re-upping your sub, by the way. I don't think I said that earlier when you came in. And Mariana is here, and she is in for the jello shots. <laughs> <laughs> yes there we go or okay yeah darlene maybe we can all just head out to your cabin and have jello shots all around um exactly uh, <laughs> and where first activity for hamajan gathering will be shots 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 but you just want plain red jello fine but we're still going to make you take it like it's a jello shot in the tiny little thing. And we're going to make you lick your tongue out of it and suck the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. Yep, yep. And um, yeah, exactly. And Andre, precisely, jello shots and pinball at Ann Ware's house. Um, and Piccola tea, jello shots are dangerous territory. They're tasty and they go down way too quickly. You better believe it. Um, <laughs> Mariana, I'm liking this conversation that I walked into. <laughs> yes, and you're gonna learn to you're gonna learn to snork. Yeah, it might just be regular Jello that you're gonna snork, but you're gonna learn to snork it. Um, <laughs> and let's see here, Mariana, lychee Jello shots sound good too. Yeah, that does. Although, I wonder what alcohol you'd use with lychee, because lychee's such a mild flavor. I wonder, I mean, you're logically you'd be like, well, vodka probably, because it doesn't taste like anything. But would vodka be like too sharp? I almost wonder if like a rum might work with lychee. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Andre, exactly, jello shots, the edibles of booze. <laughs> And, um, Shock, I don't have anything else on my little list of chatbot to do. The only reason why I asked about the weather thing was because Gina, right before you popped on the chat, had tried to do it. And I was like, um, my stream is subpar when it comes to stream bot bots. We need help. And so you came in to the rescue. Um, I'll think of something, I suppose. But, you know, you know, you know stuff. You can make it. You can do other things if you think if you think that they should be there. Put them there. Um, <laughs> Kenny from the Cove, I submit that we all snork, 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 snork. I agree. That would exactly. Yes, that's it. Marmac, hey, good to see you. We are talking about jello shots. We were talking about coffee. We were talking about coffee jello. And then you know, you know what happens. And um, Andre, oh, they have a lychee liqueur? Well, then there we go. That might be what we want to use instead. And um, <laughs> and where you know how to snarfle down, but not snork. All right, yeah, we'll have to teach you. Um, um, <laughs> let's see here. Poppy Shaney, since this is a PG show, I can't take the jello shot chat to the next step of body jello shots. Or maybe you just did. <laughs> 
Well, you were the one who brought the topic up, it seems. <laughs> oh my, the trouble we accidentally find ourselves getting into here on the chat. The songs and the memories of in 2110. Excuse me. Um, yeah, exactly, Rick. Coffee chat morphed into jello shots. You got it. Um, and Andre, the coffee shop in, in my town, Burian, had both coffee and booze. Well, I mean, it sort of seems logical. In fact, I'm not really sure why more bars don't up their coffee game. Because virtually every bar does serve coffee. They just don't necessarily serve coffee drinks um you know like lattes etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's just like i don't know why why not um i don't know um let's see here boiler makers boiler makers are um not really my favorite because i don't like whiskey but at the same time they are a very convenient way to um mostly just drink beer but then like really up the alcohol intake every once every third beer and um <laughs> let's see here um <laughs> fuzzy cat so 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 um let's see here uh andre oh it was a liquor store and they served it i don't know what coffee shop you went to Burian press i haven't been to i have to check i don't need Clearly, you know more about the place in my town than I know. All right, I'll just have to, I'll have to double check what you're doing, what's going on in my town. And um, Pocola tea, Jello shots morphing into salmon. That's gonna be awkward. Well, I'll bet you we can do it because you see, tapioca boba balls, very similar to the little um, coffee jellos are very similar in size and texture to salmon roe. The little salmon eggs that the salmons put in the gravel while they're going and spawning. That's exactly it. There we go, that's our transition. How about that? Um, so, um, no, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the salmons in a little bit, but, but maybe not at the moment, because um, let's see here. The business that replaced one of your IHOPs is a combination breakfast and cocktail bar restaurant. Oh yeah, they have one of those in um, Spokane. It's called the Satellite, and it is. Um, I think it's open 24 hours. Specializes in breakfast, but yeah, it's a bar. Although it doesn't serve all the time because you can't. Um, and it is like the hot, hip, happening spot in town. Great bar, um, super fun place. It's one of the few places in Spokane that I'm like, yeah, let's go do that in Spokane. Cause I don't really like <laughs> Spokane, so, um, <laughs> so there you go. Pecola tea, salmon roe. You love Ikura on sushi. So funny you should say that. So I am um, out camping on the coast, right? And you know, obviously not looking good or whatever. Been camping for days, and we're at this area that. Um, we're at a campsite that has a fish processing area. And so this guy had just caught a huge salmon and she had a bunch of roe and he was gathering the roe. And so, and I was chatting him up. I thought he was kind of cute. I was trying to get my best flirt on. I was failing miserably. And so I said, you know, being all hoity and toity, um, you know, it's like, oh, that looks like really good roe. You know, what do you plan, you know, what do you plan to make with that or, you know, are you gonna eat that, blah, blah, blah. And he just looked at me, he's all, this ain't roe, this is bait. And I was just like, all right then, I definitely am not succeeding, flirting with this guy at all. Exit stage left, <clears throat> yeah. So, um, <laughs> Rick, alcohol, salmon, roe shots, what did I miss? No, nothing like that. Um, <laughs> so um yeah so he he took his he, so and yeah he took his salmon and he left and i walked back to my campsite going 
I really need to know. I thought I was, I thought I had a really good game there, but yeah, I clearly had no game. Mm-hmm, yeah, no game. So, all right, well, we're already uh, <laughs> swimming on over to the, the salmon topic, so might as well hit it hard today. All right, it is Salmon Talk Sunday, and, um, and I want to, um, um, I want to show you basically the area of the world that we're talking about here because there's a lot of different types of salmon. There's Atlantic salmon, there's Pacific salmon. Basically salmon is a term that's used for any fish, almost any fish that runs or that starts in freshwater, goes out to the ocean and then comes back. Some of these are true salmon, some of these are not true salmon, but salmon's kind of an umbrella territory or term for that type of fish. We're only going to be talking about the type of salmon, uh, the Pacific salmon that are in the Salish Sea. And this, you know I love my maps. So this is the Salish Sea. The Puget Sound area <clears throat> in the south part of this map of the highlight, that's where Seattle is. You can see Seattle Olympia, that's in the United States. Then further north, you're getting into the Canadian territories um, and, uh, and the Canadian watersheds. So, um, so this is the, the, the landscape of which we are, we are talking about right now. And so, let's see here. Um, so, as we talked about, oops, there we go. As we talked about last Wednesday, um, we talked a little bit about the life cycle of the salmon. And, um, and yeah, Gina, my area, the Pacific Northwest, exactly. Although the Salish Sea is specifically here. Let's go back for a minute. The Salish Sea, as you can see, is specifically the interior waters, not the Pacific Ocean. Now, obviously, Pacific salmon end up in the Pacific Ocean, but the Salish Sea is the interior saltwater environment, bio, bio region, uh, that is the Strait of Georgia, <coughs> the Queen Charlotte Islands, Puget Sound, etc. So, um, so not, not like real ocean. We're talking inward, in, inland seas, as it were. So, um, all right. So as we talked about on last Wednesday, a lot of our southern resident whales depend on salmon for their, um, for their diet. And as you can see, this is a an eight sort of a seven to eight cycle a life cycle life cycle. Um, and exactly, yeah, Pukola tea, number eight zombie fish. That's yeah, Maka dead gone die. And so, but number one, as you can see, that is the infamous salmon row. You know, <clears throat> bait. Yeah, well, whatever. Bait, salmon row topping for sushi it all depends on who you talk to on just what they call it but number one is obviously the little the little eggies and then there's the little fishies um then there's the bigger little fishies etc etc so we're gonna talk here we go it begins the eggs those were those little orange cycles and then um the other things are called alevins i guess and they're super tiny and they hang out really low um and sort of like under the rocks and then um, and, uh, and as you can see, they stay close to the red. Now the red, the term red, R-E-D-D, -D, is, um, is basically the nest, is the fish nest, is what that is the term. So they hang out near the fish nest for a while. And they still have some of their egg sac on them. And so then, after they emerge, um, from the nest, um, <laughs> Pagolti, what? I thought Alvin was a shipmunk. Yeah, I've actually never heard, and I don't know how to say that word. A L E V I N S. Alvins? Al Alvins? I, I don't know how to say that word. I've literally never heard that term before. So, you and I are both um, guessing here. And yes, Andre, it is PowerPoint time. Although the funny thing is, is I've never used PowerPoint, so I don't actually know if what you're saying is right, but um, but I'm sure it is, because I've been told that um, that OBS is a lot like PowerPoint, so there you go. And it sounds like 11, 11, 11, 
All right, well, whatever. Whatever. We're going to go to the next stage. The next stage, Rick was right. He's like, they're small fries, ain't they? And it's like, well, sometimes they're small fries, but I eventually call them smolts. But we'll get to the smolt stage next. But the fries, though, they're the little ones who come up from the nest and they fill up their slim bladders with oxygen and they do all sorts of things. Now, um, this is something I didn't know. The smolts sometimes, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes the smolts spend one to two years hanging out in the fresh water. Sometimes the, 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 so that's the Chinooks that do that. The, uh, excuse me, the sockeyes spend one to two years in fresh water before migrating to the sea. The Chinook, they usually only spend about five, five months. Now the Chinook, they are, um, they are the salmon that the southern re residents prefer. Uh, but the southern residents will eat other salmon. They're not quite that much of a foodie snob yet. And then um, coho fry will spend over a year in the fresh water, right? Now we'll get into the different we'll get into the different salmons later. But first, I'm going to say hello, Vanilla Coke Pepsi. You've come in on Salmon Talk Sunday. We're talking we're, we're learning about Pacific salmon. So um, now, whoops, hold on. Now the C word migration is when if you saw me on um, the stream on Wednesday and I like suddenly was like smolt. Um, this is <laughs> this was why. So smolts are the ones that are tiny but they're heading towards the sea. And they hang out in a lot of, um, in a lot of uh, backwaters and little side channels as opposed to like the main rivers. And so the backwaters and side channels, they're created by the sediment that naturally flows uh, from, you know, down river. So when you've got a dam in the river, it holds back all of that sediment, and eventually those um, those channels and backwaters and side channels that are protective of the baby fish, they all get they get basically washed away, and so um, and so when huge storms come in and there's a lot of rainfall and the rivers run high, all the baby salmon's that are supposed to be hanging out in this it's still in the murky semi-salty, semi-fresh water get washed out to sea way too early. Um, so having naturalized river um, riverbeds is extraordinarily important to the growth cycle of the salmons. And so then they um, head out to the ocean. Now, this picture here is exactly what I'm talking about. Um, see all those little side channels and things like that? Those are healthy and you need those to help the salmons hang out before they head out to the big ocean. And, um, and let's see here. And so uh, sometimes some, um, every salmon has a different ocean lifespan. As you can see here, the chum may spend up to seven years at sea, uh, but pink salmon on the other hand spend a fixed 18 months um, and then sockeye spend about two years and looks like coho another 18 months and Chinook, which you guys, that's the, that's the salmon's, that's the, the whale's favorite salmon. The Chinook spend up to eight years in the ocean before being, before they spawn back to their natural stream. So these types of recovery efforts, um, these types of recovery efforts are uh, take a very long time to know to know if they're going to be working. You know, just because they released you know 400,000 salmon smolts into a certain river, you know, you might not know until eight years later just how how many of them survived and how many of them are going to be coming back. And so the coming back, the spawning migration, is um, is basically where a lot of folks in the Pacific Northwest do most of their salmon fishing. And like I mentioned last Wednesday, uh, you generally want to catch the salmon as close to the river mouth as possible, because the further upstream they go, the further, more beat up they get. Um, and we're talking, you know, hundreds of miles upstream is what they, some of them have to, have to do. So, um, you know, uh, king salmon, does king salmon only live in the ocean? No, king salmon starts, um, king salmon starts 
in the streams, just like every other uh, salmon, king salmon is the Chinook salmon. So when we talk about the Chinook, let's see here, we're going back here. Um, the Chinook spend uh, up to eight years in the ocean. So they certainly spend a lot of time in the ocean, but the Chinook, no, they start in the streams um, and then, you know, uh, hang out in the ocean for quite some time and then and then uh, come on back to, you know, to make their babies. And so this is when they're, you know, coming in to make their babies. And, um, and then this is the zombie fish. After they make their babies, the river, um, you, <laughs> after the salmon make their babies, even though it might be in a hot August day, oftentimes you don't want to go swimming in those rivers because it's floating with dead fish. Um, so yeah, um, but the dead fish then, you know, rot on the fish bank on the on the riverbank and create nutrients that create the naturalized that you know feed the feed the plants etc cetera, etc cetera. so even though it's gross um it's actually part of the beautiful cycle <laughs> so um let's see here um so uh andre do fishermen pay into river restoration like the duck hunters do to restore wetlands so more ducks can be there uh, and you can hunt. I really like the duck stamps for that reason. I honestly don't know exactly what the fishing licenses go to, but every state has their own fishing license. And um, it, unlike the duck program, which I think is federal, the fishing licenses are, are overseen by the state. And where the money goes to uh, it, for each state with their fishing license, I actually have no idea. And um, I would like to say that some of the money goes to restoration, but actually I think the money for restoration goes comes more from the access passes to the backlands. Um, there are certain areas that, uh, certain trails, certain parking lots, certain areas that you're not allowed to go to unless you have paid 50 bucks for that year to have a pass to go to access those lands. Um, and I think that those passes are where a lot of restoration money comes from, but don't quote me on that. Um, that's a good question and I wish I could tell you. Um, let's see here. Rick, you agree with what you're saying except only go to saltwater. Here in Freshwater Lake, Michigan, we got four types of salmon, Chinook, Coho, Pink, and Atlantic, all planted more than 50 years ago and all run up the streams now. Interesting, Rick. Um, yeah, those are obviously all, um, you know, planted. And so I didn't realize, though, that the salmon could spend all of their time in fresh water. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, that I had no idea that um, that they could um, that they could survive like that. So um, let's see here. So. Uh, so Rick for Rick is saying to Andre, you hear it here in Wisconsin, there's a salmon stamp extra on the regular fishing license to support the fish. Yeah, I think, you know, I haven't bought a fishing license in so long in Washington. I can't remember, but I think there might be an endorsement for salmon fishing. Like if you just have a regular fishing license, you can't necessarily go catch salmon. Like I think you might need an endorsement, but oh, once again, don't quote me on that one. Um, yeah, um, so let's see here. Um, and Kenny, you're saying in Texas, part of the cost of the fishing license goes to maintaining and protecting the fish. Yeah, I can only assume that that's, um, that is part of what the license goes for. But, um, but honestly, I, 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 it's been so long, I cannot remember all the fine print in that. Um, uh, so let's see here. Um, so, um, okay, cool. So, all right. So let's see here. Um, <laughs> Darlene's saying you caught big mouth bass and Northern Pike, but not any salmon. Not sure if I could pull such a big fish in. They fight back, you know, oh yes, indeedy. They fight back and they're very, very large. In fact, um, so, uh, let's, so now that we're talking about the different salmons that are, you know, in places and stuff. So this is one type of salmon right wait hold on this is what i wanted to, this is what i wanted to do so um these are basically the salmon that i'm talking about right now now pardon me i had to take a drink now the upper 
right hand coastal cutthroat trout, we're not talking about that. The bottom left hand fish, the steelhead, we're not talking about that. Those are trouts that are also ocean going. These other remaining five fish are actual salmon. Like these seven fish, two of them are different species than the other five. The other five are actually salmon. The, um, the coastal cutthroat trout and the steelhead are both types of trout, which is a different species. But as I said earlier in the stream, salmon is often used as an umbrella term for any fish that goes to the ocean, starts in the stream, goes to the ocean and comes back. And that's what I meant by that. The coastal cutthroat trout and the steelhead are oftentimes mistakenly referred to as salmon. They are not. They are trout. Period, end of story. They are trout. <laughs> but what we're talking about is the sockeye salmon, the chum salmon, the coho salmon, the pink salmon, and the chinook salmon. And all of those salmons have different names. So, oops. So this is a pink salmon, right? This is a pink salmon that was caught in a river. Now the pink salmon is also known as the humpy salmon. Because the humpy salmon, as you can see on the bottom picture, they have a big hump. You can see in this picture, they got a big hump. The humpy salmon and the pink salmon, even though they look nothing alike in their ocean phase and spawning phase, they are the same fish. Look at that. It doesn't it's so hard to see that they are the actual that they are actually the same fish. Like how scientists figured out that this top one and this bottom one are actually the same thing. I don't know, but they did. And so there you go. And a Pussy Cat Steelhead is the one that I would like to catch you and everyone else, my friend, because if you've ever had a steelhead, holy flirking snit. It is like the best salmon crossed with the best halibut. Oh, it is the, <clears throat> it is the prize fish. It is the prize fish. Steelhead are to die for. They are so, so good. Andre though saying not much salmon now in the Bay Area, but some rivers have restored and some are coming back in small numbers. Exactly, up and down the coast, we're getting res restoration of all of these. So this is the pink, the pink salmon, the humpy salmon. The pink salmon is one of the smaller salmons. Um, now this one, I think is the chum, but let's find out. Um, nope, I'm a big liar. So, um, so the coho salmon, AKA the silver salmon, the silver salmon is basically only silver in the ocean phase. Yet look at this guy, he caught it in the river. So I don't know how that worked, but okay. And the spawning phase adult is bright red. Um, but the best thing about the coho salmon, the silver salmon is, for me at least, it's my favorite salmon fish. It's the lightest fleshed color um, and it's the mildest flavor. So, um, and so if, if I had to, you know, take my pick of salmon, it would always be a silver. But a lot of people look at me like I'm really weird because that is not the best fish according to people who like fish. And, oh, Puzzy Cat, okay, so snook is salt and freshwater fish, awesome. Cool, okay, I didn't know that, um, that Florida had those, those top fish too, but it totally makes sense, especially a place like Florida. Um, now this one, this is the chum salmon. This is the dog salmon. Um, and the chum salmon, dog salmon, uh, keto salmon, a lot of people think that that's the crummiest salmon. I actually don't mind it. Um, I like it better than the pink. I think the pink is like the worst salmon, but that's just me. Um, but as you can see, once again, very different looking fish from the ocean to the spawning phase adult. Um, now we're gonna go, um, and by the way, the chum salmon is one of the smallest species of salmon smallest Do you, can you tell you can tell right by that um by that uh picture that that guy is holding that fish that chum salmon that that one right there yeah that's one of the, yeah that's one of the smaller species of uh of salmon just so you know that's small this small kind of salmon 
Yeah, exactly. That's a scary salmon, precisely. So um, this is the king salmon. The king salmon is generally one of the bigger salmons. And even though, um, <laughs> look at them teeths, exactly. Now, even though this is clearly taken in a river, to me, it looks more like an ocean phase adult that he just caught as opposed to the spawning phase adult. But I don't know, man. I am not a fish ID expert by any stretch of the imagination. All I know is what the internet told me. And the internet told me, this is a king salmon. And this dude got a king salmon. And it's a nice looking fish. I'd eat that fish. And um, yeah, exactly. Salmon get very scary looking when they get to the spawning phase. Their jaws turn very hooked and nasty. Um, and they look like they could really give you a bite, actually. Um, so now this is the last one. I wasn't able to get a side-by-side, -side, but this is the, um, the sockeye salmon's ocean phase. And this is the sockeye salmon's spawning phase. Look at those tephises. Um, now the sockeye salmon is also known as the red salmon. And when I say red salmon, I mean a red salmon. Not only um, is the outer body red, but uh, we, <laughs> the flesh is so dark red. It is the reddest, darkest flesh salmon that you will find. And so many people love sockeye. They think sockeye is the pinnacle of the best of the best of the best of salmon. And I've known plenty fishermen who would literally trade 100 pounds of any other salmon for 10 pounds of sockeye. That's how loved sockeye is amongst a lot of people. I hate sockeye salmon. It's oily, it's the strongest flavored, it's just, it's too much, man, too much. So for anybody who loves the sockeye salmon, come sit next to me because I will share my plate. Um, so, so yeah, so there we go. That's our little, our little salmon. What, what, what's going on with the salmon? That's what's going on with the salmon. And, um, and so only a couple more things to talk about with salmon talk, salmon talk Sunday. Um, but I do want to, you know, make these things clear. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier last Wednesday that damming rivers is causing a huge problem with uh with restoring salmon uh salmon runs now um <laughs> now they've come up with a solution that um marmac you're with you you agree with me on the sockeye i like the mildest please exactly okay so marmac here we're gonna here let's look at my face for a minute seriously marmac so marmac can I'm sure those of you who've had many types of salmon before, you might just be like, why does some of it taste a little different than others? Because it's the different varieties. And um, Marmac, obviously, and I, well, we're going to have to not sit next to each other because we'll be fighting over the silver salmon while we're, like, giving away all of our sockeye. But we'll be, we'll be thumb wrestling for the silver salmon because, to me, the silver salmon is the mildest. Um, and there you have it, Rabbit. Uh, I don't even, I mean, I will eat sockeye if it's smoked, but I actually like, it's flavor is so strong that it even argues with the smoking process, right? Um, so, uh, so <laughs> shock, you can have all my fish and I'll just take your ribeye. No, you won't. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> And Andre, you remember when you saw the aftermath of a salmon spawn? It was stinky. It absolutely was. There has been more than one day in my childhood where I was like, yeah, we're going to go swimming in the river. Oh, 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 no, we're not going to go swimming in the river, are we? Because, yes, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a river full of rotting, floating dead fish. It's not exactly, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so um so anyway so um so what i did though let's where did everything go uh okay so as i said last wednesday part of the problem for salmon restoration is all of the dams and there's a couple different ways that you can deal with the dam situation one of the ways is to remove the dams 
and that is happening. However, there are a lot of very important dams that provide electricity and other infrastructure to a lot of people, and removing dams is a huge undertaking. It's not exactly something you can just like do. However, there is something that you can just like do that they've invented that I talked about, and that's the salmon cannon. So, what I want to do is I want to show you this little video. Whoops, hold There's on. There's something on you. I want to show you this little video about the salmon cannon because it's kind of flipping cool. But it is not a solver for the problems, and we'll get into that after we talk about it, after you see the salmon cannon video. But here is the salmon cannon video. There's something unusual going on at the Clea Dam long tube along the river going over the dam and into the lake. That's a fish transport system by Whoosh Innovations that gives migrating salmon a free joyride over an impassable dam. Its nickname, the Salmon Cannon. From the fish's perspective, this is a instantaneous transport over a large barrier that they never could have gone over before. That's right. This portable system costing around $10 million, about one-sixth the cost of traditional fish passages, uses a tube filled with air and water mist to safely transport migrating salmon more than a kilometer from the river, over the dam, and into the lake above. So here's where it all begins. The salmon swim upstream against the current, and when they get to this pass, they will naturally swim into the system, and that's where their incredible journey begins. Once inside, the salmon swim through a small waterfall and into a chute, which then takes them inside a scanner that makes sure they're actually a salmon. The scanner sends the information to our sorting computer, and the sorting computer switches this gate. And the gate says, all right, it's either going to the whoosh tube or it's uh, a reject fish. We're not going to transport that one. And this all happens automatically? All automatically, yep. And in the span of less than a second. But the real wow factor starts when the salmon is shot into the flexible tube like a rocket. Let's see that again in slow motion. So now I'm at the top of the dam, which is 50 meters high. The salmon travel overhead through the tube at a speed of 45 kilometers per hour. The entire bullet train-like journey, taking less than 60 seconds, ends with a final splash into the lake, where the unscathed salmon swims off to spawn. The Yakima system historically had about 800,000 salmon returning here every year. That was the second largest run uh, attached to the Columbia itself. Um, and by the early 90s, because all of these dams were built without salmon and fish passage, we were down to three to 4,000. The return of salmon in the Pacific Northwest is especially important to the Yakima Nation, a group of Native American tribes that revere salmon. They've built their economy, their religion, everything around the salmon. And so when they lost the salmon, um, it was a huge loss to them in, in many ways. Woosh is looking to help solve fish passage issues around the world as well. If we can help address those issues of fish passage, which exist in every country, China, Southeast Asia in particular, and South America, due to the increases in hydropower um, installations that have been going on over the last number of years, that the technology can spread from here and truly be useful in other places in the world. And the salmon cannon has another use as well, at least for TV comedians. Let me tell you how much I love the salmon cannon. I love it so much, we made our own cannon this week. Let's see where this salmon ends up. Goodbye, I'm forget. The salmon cannon, bringing joy to both humans and salmon alike. May Lee, CGTN, Cleelum, Washington. Okay, alrighty, so that's the little, oops, hold on, I gotta turn my things down so you don't get double stuffs. Alright, so, that is the, um, the, um, <laughs> the salmon cannon, the whoosh tube, as it were, um, and it is super awesome technology. However, as we discussed earlier in the Salmon Talk Sunday, part of the salmon's journey to the ocean 
is going along those side channels and those little backwaters, the little estuary areas that are al that are off the main river. And those areas are created by the sands and the sediment that naturally flow through the riverbed. However, when there are dams, that traps, effectively traps the sediment and doesn't continue to release it down the stream. And so those side channels and those little estuarial um, territories aren't created, so it's more difficult for the salmon to build their nests and to hang out before they head to the ocean, etc., etc. So, um, one last little thing to talk about what I'm talking about here. So, the whoosh tubes are pretty amazing. However, um, in the state of Washington, there is a, uh, a, <clears throat> a river on the Olympic Peninsula called the Elwha River. And the Elwha River has actually, it was one of the first, I think actually in our state, was one of the first uh, rivers to get their dams removed and in the process Elwha is basically one big science lab at this point. Draining the lakes <clears throat> have um, draining the dam removing the dams and the lakes that were created behind them have has restored the Elwha River more to its natural flow but <clears throat> the, one of the best things about draining the lakes which I think with Lake Mead and things that are being discovered um, at the bottom of Lake Mead and Lake Powell, we can appreciate this as well. When one of the lakes was drained after the dam was removed, the local tribe finally got to see, for the first time in over a hundred years, their creation stone. The stone that, according to their tribe's creation legend, was how they came to Earth an actual stone that was covered for a hundred years by the water and the people of the tribe honestly didn't know that that stone actually existed they thought it was just part of the stories they didn't know that there was a physical actual rock because no one was alive who had seen it before everyone who'd actually seen that rock had already passed on and when they removed that dam the tribe got their rock back. And um, I think that's pretty cool. But that's not what we're talking about. What we are talking about is the sediment. When those dams were released and the sediment was finally learned to make its way downstream back to the ocean, this was literally the difference. Now, as you can see on the picture on the left, the dam didn't get removed until after 2011. This is relatively new stuff that we're talking about here. And as you can see on the left, that stretch of beach is barely existent. But on the right, five years later, five years after the dam was removed, Look at how much sediment was brought back to the beach front. And look at all of those places that little salmons can hang out and save themselves from the big floods that come through and this, that, and the other thing. And so uh, this is an example of what kinds of things happened after those dams were removed. Before the dams were removed, <laughs> there was a 98% reduction in fish population. And <clears throat> the fish population, prior to the dams being moved, was majority pink salmon, a little bit of chum, tiny, 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 tiny little bit of, of sockeye, some chinook and some steelhead, and some coho. Post-dam, the coho just rebounded. So did the Chinook, the coho and the king, both. Um, so the diversity of the fish has started to change. Now, how this will be, now all of these populations are still considered in danger, okay? Um, but, uh, but basically though, just in the five years where these particular statistics were, um, were created, 
that it, you know, there's a difference in the river, the riverbed, the riverfront, the oceanfront, the whole thing. And uh, so the point of that, the point of all that is that whoosh tube is awesome, but it doesn't solve the problem. It's only one tiny tool that we're gonna have in our arsenal of weaponry to fix this problem. Now, um, Pussy Pussycat, how many bodies did they find at the bottom of the lake? If you're talking about the lakes on Lake El on Elwa, I don't think they found any bodies. If you're talking about Lake Mead, I think we're up to like four or more. Um, and I'm not sure if there was any bodies found in Lake Powell, but Lake Powell right now is dropping so dramatically that a lot of Native American archeological, um, uh, significant archeological sites from Native American history uh, have been uncovered with the dropping water levels. So, um, so, uh, so, uh, so yeah, no, uh, yeah, so Mead, okay, so Mead is where, yeah, Mead is where all the bodies are. Yeah, I don't know how many bodies they found, but I think there's a few. Um, I think there's a few. But um, yeah, Lake Powell is the water, the dropping waters are revealing the archeological sites. Similar to the dropping water that uh, revealed the uh, creation rock for the particular tribe uh, that used the Elwha as their home base. I wish I could tell you what tribe it was. I cannot remember. We have quite a few tribes around here. And um, so unfortunately, I don't have um, that information, but I can say that the tribe was extraordinarily excited to, um, to have found that creation rock. And ultimately that location, the location of said rock is actually, is, has been kept secret since they discovered it or rediscovered, it, excuse me. Um, so I'm not even sure where along the riverbed it is. It's somewhere along the river, um, but it's a very secluded place in an area that you're not supposed to be without permission. So don't go looking for it. The Olympic Peninsula has a lot of places you can hike don't be looking for creation rock and um let's see here um lake powell like he doesn't have uh because it's you know, oh lake mead closer to vegas yeah it makes sense lots of cars too now how many cars were at the bottom of any of those lakes i don't know my best guess is um is that uh it um all the lakes had a lot of cars at the bottom of them and let's see here. Shock, you're saying it was the Kalalum tribe. All right, all right, that makes sense. That's, um, that's a, I, I actually think it's more than, or it's, I think there's a subsection to the Kalalum tribe that that Elwha place, but yes, Kalalum is the, the area, um, an area, uh, bleh, mm -hmm, yeah. And okay, there we go. The lower Elwha Kalalum tribe. There we have it. That, yes, that's, that's it. There we, I'll go with that one. Um, so, cause, all the different um, areas have different, you know, um, have different tribal names and associations. Just because you're part of a larger umbrella group doesn't mean you have a smaller subgroup that you identify with. So um, let's see here. Shock, they're the ones who are in the news story. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so I'm not so, so you guys, the Discover Rock, uh, yeah, I'm not making it up. Shock actually found the news story for it. So there you have it. And, um, and, um, so Puzzy Cat, here in Florida, it's the grass is disappearing in the river. It's necessary for the baby fish. Oh, heck yeah, dude. All that, like, I don't know if it's called eel grass or sea grass or what it's called in your area, but yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, um, the brackish areas and all the plant life, aquatic plant life that live in those areas are absolutely monumentally important to baby fish um safety growth it's a way to hide um you know it, escape predation uh all of the i'm not at all surprised um that um that the grass is an issue for the baby fishies and it's so bad that the manatees oh are starving from no grass that's why i've been seeing all these people like feeding manatees and they're not getting chastised for it like they're they're considered heroes for it it's just like hmm that kind of makes me uncomfortable but now i see what they're doing and um oh no that's not good and piccola tea 
fry grass? You know, I don't know. Is it called fry grass? Because it maybe should be called fry grass. And um, so let's see here. Also, the loss of the mangrove in Florida has been hard on the fish. Once again, those mangrove roots, right, going into the water, creating shade, creating safety zones for the tiny critters to, um, to not get caught up in a current if there's a huge flood that's, you know, rushing water out to the ocean. And um, a fuzzy cat, everyone uses fertilizer and it runs off into the river and ocean. Yeah, you know, I... Um, Oh, you know, this topic like borders on some controversial political politi political tists. But seriously, grass is not good for the environment. I really wish more people would stop with that monoculture and get way more native land plant coverings for whatever area they are. I don't know what's normal in Florida, but grow it. I don't know what's normal in Las Vegas. Grow it. I don't know. I don't know, but just don't grow the grass. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, and um, <laughs> I know, shock exactly. We only got 10 minutes to go. Don't go full on political. Yeah, yeah, but seriously. Um, and um, and what I say, by the way, when I say don't grow the grass, I mean lawn, I mean on your front yard, because you want to grow the grass in the river where they need it in the things. Um, and by I say in the things, I mean, you know, the fishies and the estuaries, they need it in the things. And the manatees, they need the grass in the things. That's in their tummies. And so, um, and then Andre, yeah, the illegal pot grows in national parks, do a lot of damage to the streams and rivers also. I think that that was an impetus to get California to really get on the legalization um, bandwagon, but I also think that even though it's legalized, it still happens in California. I do think, though, that that's a, <clears throat> a, a huge problem because of the major concentration of the fertilizer that is used in illegal grow operations. But um, I think really California and maybe parts of Oregon are probably the only places that have that as an issue um, just because the weather's not right you know for any place else you can't really do it you can't really do it in Washington um like that and so uh and so uh I do think that that's maybe an exclusive to California thing still a problem um but I do think that is actually a a, a more local top issue and um and Kenny from the Cove xeriscaping going native with your lawn is getting more popular here in Texas that's fantastic because any, I mean, honestly, you know, <laughs> we were just talking about the shrinking lakes, right? You know, I mean, like water's becoming more and more of an issue, right? And um, <laughs> so lawns are just one big sponge of monoculture that doesn't help with the bees. It doesn't help with the birds. It doesn't help with the flowers. It doesn't help with the trees. Sing the song as you will. It doesn't help with any of those things. And it can hurt some of those things by leaching, you know, using up too much water and leaching uh, the fertilizer used to keep it green, leaching off into the rivers. So, um, so I think that it's, uh, I think that it's awesome that Texas is, what, it, what with it being as dry as Texas is, I'm glad that some folks are like, hey, you know what? Why don't I grow plants that like, like it dry? <laughs> Cause we live in this place that's kind of like, dry <laughs> maybe we should grow plants that like it dry <laughs> exactly Anne, and much easier to maintain you got it all right photo luke hey how's it see honda all right terry in scotland carl in arkansas it looks like we have got some raiders coming in from the party bus crew thank you so much you guys for coming in we're talking about, well, we were talking about salmon, but now we're talking about the grass that you grow on your front lawn and how it damages the grass that's trying to grow in the rivers and the little fishies and the big manatees in the rivers need the grasses. So there we go. We're talking, we're talking about grass, man. We're talking about grass. Oh, and we actually were talking a little bit about weed too. <laughs> <laughs> so good to see you 
And um, Andre, thank you so much for gifting some subs to OG Sumo Vibe. And, um, and oh my goodness, thank you, Andre, for the bits. A whole bunch came of, blah, 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 blah. a whole bunch of things happened as I was babbling. So, um, let's see here. Uh, um, let's see here. All right, so got flowers in the flowery land, according to Darlene. And Pussycat, you're the only one in your block that's done it so far, the zero escaping. You know, it's funny, actually. Um, I have a neighbor who, I don't know if it, I don't know if she lives like in an HOA zone or something, but she was just bragging on Facebook how she got one of her neighbors to sign off on allowing her to zero escape her front yard. And now she just has to wait on the other neighbor to sign off. So I don't know what that was all about, but I'm glad that you're doing it regardless. And Pecola T, props to the French activists who poured concrete into golf holes because they were exempt from water restrictions. Tee -hee. Honestly, when I saw that they did that, I was like, oh. yeah, I'm not suggesting that anyone should go do that. But I'm not not suggesting that anyone should go do that either shall we say <laughs> Kenny from the Cove thanks so much for the 400 400 biddies and yes you just made it in time for the for the talk about the grass and um yeah exactly because I got I don't have to pay anyone more grass anymore you got it man that is exactly it and oh wait is OG Sumo Vibe here I didn't see him say didn't see him but hey OG good to see you here last time you were here I wanted to say hi but my fingers were covered with meat um, and I was making meatballs and you were in and out before I could say hi um, Cuz I think we were watching something so I didn't want to say it in the mic. I don't know. Anyway um, Yeah, and you don't have to have any sprinklers exactly Puzzy cat. You know what's up. You know the right way to do it You know exactly how to do it. So um, <clears throat> All right, so We've got three minutes to the bottom of the hour and we've managed to almost sort of avoid politics ish ish we do a lot of ish here. But anyway, we're going to wrap it up today. And I want to thank you guys so much for putting up with the um, with the Salmon Talk Sunday. We probably won't make this a regular thing, but uh, Pecola T put a little bee in my bonnet. And I was like, I'm going to do all the things. I'm going to teach them all of the things. And so I taught you all of the things. Way too many things. I know. I know. So I want to thank you guys for hanging out and putting up with my little to be a teacher today um <laughs> and that's right i want to thank you guys for coming up that's kenny from the cove coming up with the word of the the new word snork and how, snork what is snork it's how you consume a jello shot we've decided snorking it up is is how you decide what that is and um or is how you do the jello shots and um let's see here um your new word for the week, whoosh, nice, nice. Uh, Pussycat, I don't think I, s did I see Photo Loop come in here? I don't know, I'm not in mod mode, so I can't see who's here. But um, but let's see here. Uh, so, um, <laughs> to snork or not to snork, that is the question. You got it. Okay, so is Katie Zora here? Hey, Katie Zora, I did not see you as everything was flying by. So, good to see you. See Honda, I'm not so sure I even said hi to you either, so. So many things going on. All right, so next Saturday, you guys, you guys, you know that I'm confrontational and adversarial, and those neither are the words that I want to do. What are they? Cont contrarian. You know I'm contrarian. You know I am. So when all y'all come at me saying that Popeye was the worst movie, it was the biggest flop, Oh, you know I went and checked your numbers, and I gotta tell y'all, you're wrong. Oh, you are so wrong. We're gonna talk about that on Satterbox at the Cinema next Saturday when I show Popeye. Yeah, that's right. I'm gonna show Popeye. Robin Williams, not a cartoon, live action. Shelley Duvall, Robin Williams, Carl in Arkansas. Oh no, oh no, you got it, but that's what we'll be doing. Popeye, Saturday, Satterbox at the Cinema. Before that, we're gonna do Chatter with Statter. Whale Talk Wednesdays, maybe? We'll see. I might have something up my sleeve for that. All right, so 
Thanks for hanging out today. I hope to see you next Wednesday, 5 p.m. West Coast time, 2 p.m. Hawaii, 8 p.m. on the East Coast, and 7 p.m. for our favorite folks, Central Time. All right, then. There we go. It's good to see you, and I'll see you soon. Take care.